I would normally start things off with, all right, folks, but, oh, dear folks, things are not all right. It's no secret that things are a mess. Just look at housing, look at food prices, look at gas prices, look at general inflation as a whole. I know, of course, going with the pandemic and then the supply chain crisis, there was all the attention to that. I know how the attention on infrastructure goes. There's no attention paid to it until it goes wrong. And that's been problematic to say the least. I mean, given the supply chain issues and then the railroad issues and then the especially bad railroad issues that have all seemed to compound right during the first six months of this year. Those problems became so prevalent that the Surface Transportation Board at the end of April held the emergency hearings on urgent issues in freight rail transport. So today we're gonna to talk about the hearings themselves. We're going to talk about everything that led up to the hearings. We're going to talk about, well, why the hearings are being held, what's going on in freight railroading, what's going on in terms of railroading as a whole in the country, and then we're going to talk about what could possibly be done to alleviate things, not just in the short term, but also in the long term, because these problems have been, oh dear, the problems have been brewing for a while, um, years in cases, decades in cases, and all the chickens have seemed to come home to roost all at the same time. It's complicated, but I'm gonna do my best to break things down. Before going on, however, I would like to thank everyone for watching not only the BNSF High Viz piece that I did, but also the testimony from BNSF Yardmaster Matt Burkhart at the Surface Transportation Board hearings. I'd also like to thank everyone who left their stories on both videos. Um, it's been incredibly helpful to read through all those stories and I really do appreciate it. So with that all being said, let's get into things. Now, we can't start the story without first discussing precision scheduled railroading, which was implemented around the year 2015. And as labor attorney Rich Edelman says, What is precision scheduled railroading? It's branding. It is simply a euphemism for ruthless cost cutting driven by finance interests who discovered that there are these duopolies that benefit from government authorizations and immunity when there's historically not been very much regulatory or enforcement standards. So there have been few impediments to cost cutting. The focus on scheduling is a distraction. The real issue is the institutionalized cost cutting under the name of a scheduling device. And if it's about scheduling, well, why do the railroads cut maintenance away and signal employees? They're not involved in when the trains move. This is also a blue skies business model that operations and infrastructure will always be in optimal conditions. And that's just delusional. Now, these cost reductions had taken form through a number of forms in the years of precision scheduled railroading. Um, the closure of yards, the sidelining of locomotives. Less than two hours for me, there's an entire lineup of around 200 Union Pacific locomotives in Tracy, California. That is one of the results of precision scheduled railroading. But most notable was the elimination of over 45,000 crew and maintenance positions throughout the railroads. That's around 29% of the workforce eliminated since the year 2016. Now, on a smaller scale, let's look at Union Pacific, specifically their railroad police. Union Pacific eliminated a lot of railroad police positions. As a result, in the Los Angeles area, just outside of the LATC, this happened. Thieves have been raiding the cargo containers on the trains that stop here to unload for months, leaving behind shredded boxes and things they don't want, like home COVID tests. Sources tell me the locks Union Pacific uses are easy to cut, and LAPD says it won't respond to reports of a train robbery unless Union Pacific asks them for help, which LAPD tells us is rare. And these theft incidents were not just isolated to Los Angeles or the Union Pacific Railroad. They were also occurring in Chicago. In one particular Norfolk Southern Yard on the south side of Chicago, there had been regular thefts occurring. Um, some of the most notable cases were gun thefts, literally breaking into containers on trains and stealing guns out of them. One container, I believe, had 150 Rugers inside it. And speaking of Chicago, one of the more notable service slowdowns that occurred last year was the shutdown of the Union Pacific Global 4 facility. Um, they were completely backlogged with containers and 
as a result, they had 25 miles of double stack trains waiting to be offloaded. Um, I understand that, of course, there were terminal issues. There was not enough manpower to get the containers off. There was just bad coordination in terms of getting the containers out of the terminal. There's another aspect to the terminal issues that I want to discuss, but for right now, let's actually get to talking about the trains. The length of trains and tonnage of trains have, of course, been affected by technology over the years, but they've been affected even more so in the past several years because of precision scheduled railroading, both in terms of wanting to reduce the number of crews as well as wanting to reduce the number of locomotives. For some more perspective on this, I would like to share some testimony from engineer Steve Grote. Increased train lengths have slowed the infrastructure. Average time spent working at terminals have increased. Trains less than 10,000 feet average no more than an hour to an hour and a half setting out and picking up cars. Whereas trains in excess of 10,000 feet the time has gone from four to six hours in these terminals. The main line that runs from Kansas City to St. Paul is a single track main line. The sidings are no longer than 8,000 feet. There is nowhere to pull over an excess of 8,000 feet train to allow another train to pass. Thus, the route has to be cleared to allow these big trains to run, causing more de delays for everything else. Since the increase of train lengths, I have noticed more hardware. What I mean by hardware is broken cars split right in half, draw bars, which is the coupler system, and knuckles, which is the part that open and closes to uncouple and couple the cars together on the grounds of the lines. These train lengths increase the in-train forces which stresses components that don't normally fail. The increased stress on these components is a major part of their failure. According to my state director, there has been 13 derailments in the state of Iowa in the past five months. In Iowa, there is very, very few places to stop these monster trains unless you block crossings, most of the time multiple crossings. In some cases, all the crossings in towns are blocked. This not only puts the safety of our crews at risk, but also the public. The increased train lengths have also extended travel times, some take, sometimes taking multiple crews to go the same distance as it would for two shorter trains. For example, a train in excess of 10,000 feet might take three crews to travel from Clinton, Iowa to Missouri Valley, Iowa. But two 5,000 feet trains can travel the same distance with only one crew. So indeed the trains are getting longer and heavier, but just how much longer and heavier are these trains? The longest train I've operated was 16,998 feet long. And no, I could not maintain track speed for that train. Last Friday, I brought a coal train, a double coal train home from uh, Missouri Valley to Clinton, Iowa. Um, it was 298 cars. It was uh, 42,000 tons. And the most track speed I could get was two times in the state of Iowa, and it was both downhill. I could maintain about between 30 and 35. I had six locomotives. I had two on the head end. I had three in the middle, and I had one on the rear. They were all on. There's no way I could have moved that train without all of them on. So if it's a question of just so much power you have, or is it also just going around curves or stopping or whatever you have to do with the train? If you split, if you split that train and run two locomotives on the head end and one on the rear, which is a standard. 145 car train, you can operate at track speed. Uh, for a coal train, we run them at 50 mile an hour. I want to look at three metrics that help evaluate this train. Horsepower per tonnage, tons per operative brake, 
and tons per dynamic brake axle. Horsepower per ton evaluates the ease at which the train can accelerate, the maximum speed at which the train can go, as well as the ability of the train to ascend grades. Let's assume for the sake of argument that all of the locomotives on this train were six axle, 4,400 horsepower locomotives. So you take all six of those locomotives, you will get a total horsepower of 26,400. Now let's divide that by the total tonnage of the train, which was listed at 42,000 tons and what results is a horsepower per tonnage rating of 0.6. 0 0.6 .6 is a poor rating. It indicates that the train is slow to ascend hills, the train is slow to accelerate, and the train is somewhat inhibited and in many cases simply unable to maintain the maximum train speed in certain territories. These next two metrics have to do with braking, the ability to slow down and stop the train. The first one is tons per operative brake, and that measures the ability of the air brake system on the train to slow down the train and come to a stop. To get that rating, we divide the total tonnage of the train, which was listed at 42,000. We divide that by the number of cars and locomotives, which in this case, it's 298 cars plus the six locomotives. That gives us 304. That results in a total tons per operative brake of around 140. When trains get to 140 tons per operative brake, that makes them extremely difficult to slow down. They take longer and they take further to come to a stop or slow down. The tonnage per operative brake issue is also worsened by the increasing train lengths, as when a train increases in length, it takes longer for the air brakes to engage. When the brakes are engaged by the engineer at the front of the train, it takes a certain amount of time at the back of the train for that brake engagement to occur. And when train lengths start getting longer and longer and longer, these brake response times just get significantly worse. The final metric we're going to take a look at is tons per dynamic brake axle, which is a measure of how effective the dynamic brakes would be at slowing down a train. Dynamic brakes slow down the train by using the traction motors on the locomotives as generators, and by that measure, slowing down the train with the use of the electromagnets inside the traction motors. Now, these brakes are only located in the locomotives, so with that measure, we instead measure the dynamic braking axles. Now, this is where things get a little bit complicated. Not only do individual locomotives have differing dynamic braking capabilities, the various railroads have their own ways of measuring the dynamic braking abilities, and even the dynamic brake axle counts on locomotives. So in order to simplify matters, let's say just for the sake of argument that all six of the locomotives on this train were General Electric AC 4400 CWs. I'm picking General Electric AC 4400 CWs because I made the earlier postulation that all six of the locomotives were six axle 4400 horsepower locomotives. And well, the AC 4400 CW is a six axle. 4,400 horsepower locomotive. Union Pacific has their own methodology to counting the number of dynamic brake axles per locomotive, as well as the number of powered axles per locomotive. And this is represented by their two measurements known as equivalent powered axles and equivalent dynamic brake axles. So in Union Pacific's system special instructions, one equivalent powered axle or one equivalent dynamic brake axle is equivalent to 10,000 pounds of tractive effort or 10,000 pounds of dynamic brake effort. And from the table in the system specific instructions, we can see that Union Pacific gives the AC 4400 CW an equivalent dynamic brake axle count of 9.8, meaning that the locomotive is capable of generating a maximum of 98,000 pounds of dynamic brake effort. Also, for simplicity's sake, we are not going to assume that any of the dynamic brake axles on any of the locomotives were cut out, because if that were the case, then we would have to adjust our measurement. So we take the equivalent dynamic brake axle count of one of the locomotives, 9.8, and we multiply that by six to get the total equivalent dynamic brake axles for the entire train, which was 58.8. 
And then to finally get the tons per dynamic brake axle, we divide the tonnage of the train, 42,000, by the total equivalent dynamic brake axle count of the train, which was 58.8. And we end up with close to 715 tons per dynamic brake axle. That high of a tonnage per dynamic brake axle means that the train is especially limited in terms of the ability of the dynamic brake axles to control the speed of the train. In some territories, that would mean that the train would be limited to 20 miles per hour as a maximum speed. Now, it is true that this train was running between Missouri Valley and Clinton, Iowa, a relatively flat stretch of track but still it is a concerning measure nonetheless. So to recap, this train had a horsepower per tonnage rating of about 0.6. It had a tons per operative brake rating of around 140 and it had a tons per dynamic brake axle rating of over 700. That meant that this train was astonishingly difficult to control and operate. Now, you would figure that with the advances in technology and the computerized locomotives that the railroads use, that running these trains would be a little bit easier. Turns out, no. The way that these companies are using the technology is pretty ridiculous. The modern locomotives utilize a system known as trip optimizer. It takes in the train's makeup, tonnage, and power, as well as the temporary and permanent speed restrictions along the route. Trip optimizer then constructs a throttle and braking plan, which more than anything is to reduce fuel consumption. At the beginning of each trip, the train operator initializes the trip by accepting the trip data train data and speed restriction data on the locomotive display. Once the trip is initialized, rolling map will be active and provide situational awareness to the locomotive engineer. Trip Optimizer takes into account factors such as permanent and temporary speed restriction when developing its optimized fuel plan that reduces braking. When needed, Trip Optimizer can automatically apply dynamic brakes to maintain plan speed and remain in auto mode thus minimizing the use of air brakes. Longer trains are heavier and require multiple engines positioned among cars. It is called distributed power. Through rolling terrain, Trip Optimizer provides automatic control of low patrol distributed power in independent mode, providing smooth train handling and minimizing in-train forces. The one problem is that Trip Optimizer has, in the name of fuel consumption, severely slowed down trains and, in effect, has completely slowed down the national network. The other thing to keep in mind is that these locomotives are indeed sending information to the railroads as they are running. And in some cases, engineers are literally being told in the middle of their runs to stop their trains and to go turn off locomotives. If the railroads really do want to improve their fuel consumption, excessively stopping and starting trains is not the way to do it. There's another aspect to Trip Optimizer, which in reality, is even more problematic. Horsepower per trailing ton was based on the power demanded by your route's ruling grade. For this next section of your route, your train is overpowered. Trip Optimizer Smart HPT optimizes train performance for a given horsepower per ton target, delivering an EPA certified 5% fuel and emission savings. Smart HPT manages locomotive horsepower in three unique ways. The Smart Planner option provides an ability for a railroad to create a target HPT in the trip optimizer offboard for a given route and train, then idles and notch limits the locomotives to comply with the HPT limit. The Auto Idle option identifies areas where the train has more horsepower than required and automatically idles the trailing units in the lead consist, saving additional fuel. The Network Control option automatically isolates locomotives in the lead consist using interconsist routing. Isolated units will then follow their railroad-specific rules for shutting down. Did you catch those two statements? Trains being overpowered and horsepower per tonnage limits? Well, the railroads did, and they took things way too far. Now, I know what you're asking. What about train velocity? Don't the railroads keep track of train velocity? Yeah, well, they used to. They used to keep track of train velocity, but now, in the days of precision scheduled railroading, the railroads do not focus on train velocity anymore. And speaking of precision scheduled railroading, that itself is why a number of these trains are hideously underpowered. So, if PSR and trip optimizer were not already enough in adversely affecting the train velocities, 
Then we also have throttle limits. Here is BNSF engineer Chris Bond to explain with his testimony. Earlier testimony, you heard about the BNSF 040 slash 550 fuel savings plan. You heard about how us engineers are, have been asked to not use any throttle when we get over 40 miles per hour on most trains. For those of you that aren't familiar with the controls of a locomotive, there are th throttle positions zero through eight. So when you go over 40 miles per hour, we are forced to reduce, also known as notch down, to idle or notch zero. You'll see the in the red box, when running a heavy train with a zero 40 restriction, your average speed actually drops well below 40 miles an hour when you notch down. This is because the engines take time to load. Now by load, I mean rev back up or produce tractive effort. So if you happen to hit a 40, happen to hit 45, 40 miles an hour before you climb a hill and notch down, you lose your momentum and you might climb that hill at 12 to 15 miles an hour, depending on train size and grade of the hill. Also, there is a throttle limit six. This means you can't use throttle, use throttle over 40 miles an hour, but you also can't climb a hill at track speed or use the throttle over notch six. Now going back to exhibit A, I would like to point out the date of April 14th, 2022. At the top of the train symbol, the VFTM PEA 108A. In the black header box, there's a date. This is important because if you would if you would now refer to exhibit one um, with the train symbol of the HNYF OKC 115A, it has a date of 415, 2022 in that red box you will see that the train, pro, train profile states exempt from throttle limiting. When the BNSF first adopted the 040 policy, I asked management, why would we want to slow down our network like that? And I was told there had been studies that show that it made no impact on our network. But that makes, that makes me ask, if it, makes no, if it made no impact on our network, then why facing a surf, when facing a surface transportation board hearing, did they cancel all the 040 slash 550 and notch limits on April 15th? The answer to Chris's question is, it's all about the money. It was never about conserving fuel. It was never about train velocity. It was purely about saving money, which is the entire focus of PSR. So when you consider all of those factors together, it results in significantly slower operations along main lines and it results in significantly slower operations in yards and terminals. With the slowing of operations in general, that results in the fuel savings being negated as well as an increased need for more crews. And I think it behooves the class ones on a short-term basis to re-explore every possible way to move this congestion. And I'm sure you've got t &E people at NS who are just as insightful and able as the BN ones we heard from this morning. And I'm sure if you can't find them, Jeremy would be happy to put you in touch with them. And I think you ought to sit down with them and figure this out. Because what I heard this morning was that these people who run the trains think they can do better if they're allowed to. And I'd pay attention to them. Now you may end up disagreeing, but now is not the time for trip optimizer. Now is the time to eliminate this congestion and get our economy back to where it should be faster than it's going now. The people who are paying more for a loaf of bread are not interested in trip optimizer. They want the grain to the flour mill. The people who are paying more at the gas pump want the ethanol over to where it's mixed with gasoline. And we heard, we heard it retack last week. And we heard again today, ethanol plants are shutting down because they can't get empties. And I don't know if that's on your line, but it's certainly throughout the network. So I think you got to have some short term, may not be consistent with your overall corporate plan, but we have a problem in this country and, and we're having this hearing because we don't want to wait six or eight months to see those employee numbers gradually go up if we don't have to. So we've talked about the trains and how they've gotten more difficult to handle. Let's now talk about the management of the operations of these trains. So regarding train length and backup, here's an interaction between STB board member Robert Primus and executives from Union Pacific. When we build our transportation plan, we restrict train length on certain corridors. So we don't take, for example, a, a 12,000 foot train and put it on a corridor that only has 8,800 foot sidings. Uh, we wanna continue to make the investments in the areas where we can run longer trains. 
and be able to then run those longer trains on there. That will not be over the entire railroad. There are places that geographically it just doesn't make sense to do that. So, now, so, so are you are you saying that, that Joe, you don't run long trains on on routes that don't have sidings to handle? You, you, it's a matter of how many long trains you run. So you've you've got your balance on every one of your corridors. So for example, we can go uh, and look at the corridor from El Paso to say Kansas City. That's designed to run a certain number of trains that are longer than say 8,000 feet. That would be true of every single corridor, but that doesn't mean that we do it every case just because we can. It, it depends largely on, on what we're transporting and, and what we can build that train to. Right, but at that, but that longer train on that network does slow the network down because it can't go on siding. So if there needs to be a crew change, if there's a power issue, uh, that train has to sit in the right of way and, and, and other trains can't get around it. I think you could find examples that would be uh, across the whole spectrum from trains that make that part of the network go faster um, because it, the corridor can handle that to others where it, in some cases it may make it a little bit slower. So, but it's the whole spectrum. I, I, I wouldn't say definitively it's gonna make them slower. Now, as you heard, that Union Pacific executive sort of dodged the question regarding running trains longer than siding lengths. One of the oldest railroad adages is to not run trains that are longer than the shortest siding, and that is specifically in case things go wrong. Just last year, I saw what happens when something goes terribly wrong with one of these trains. A Union Pacific train, an eastbound container train on the Sunset Route, did nothing short of explode basically right on the sunset route. Um, it derailed at what I will assume was 70 miles an hour, the maximum track speed, and it ended up destroying both of the main lines uh, for a certain length. And they actually had to take repair trains from both El Paso and Tucson. They had to get them there to the site of the crash. And the only reason they were able to do that was because number one, the entire territory was double tracked and number two they were able to store all of the trains on one side of the double track main in order to get those repair trains to the site now in territories that do not have multiple main tracks it's just one main track with sidings these massive psr trains when they do derail and they are derailing with a higher frequency because of how long and heavy they are they have the potential to cause massive hangups in the national network. What's concerning about that testimony from the Union Pacific executives is that they basically admitted to gambling on there being nothing going wrong with any of these long trains that are simply unable to fit in the sidings. Running a railroad like this is not innovative or cost effective, it is simply careless. And what did UP instructor Glenn Roper once say about being careless? A little bit careless, that's like being a little bit pregnant. And when issues do happen, let's say a knuckle breaks, that's pretty common and that's been happening a lot. That has the potential to seriously delay a single track section of mainline especially if the train is just simply unable to fit in a siding. Besides, in those cases of fixing a busted knuckle, you have to factor in the extended length of the train as well as the extended time for which to have the brake system recharge for that long of a train. When something like that happens, we're talking about hours upon hours of delays. Continuing in the spirit of board member Primus's questioning, in the case of crew issues, if a crew runs out their hours of service, if the train itself is too long to fit in a nearby siding, it would be necessary to tie down the train right there on the main line. In the case of power issues, this is actually further compounded by PSR. Because these engines have had deferred maintenance, they have not had the necessary checkups and repair jobs and replacements of components, the railroads are simply gambling that nothing goes wrong on these locomotives. And do keep in mind, these trains have basically been cut down as much as possible to eliminate redundancy. They've been cut down to eliminate the excess locomotives on the train. Because trains are running with the bare minimum amount of power to make it through a territory, let alone go through that territory at maximum authorized track speed, one locomotive having an issue could ultimately prevent the train from even making it through the territory. And if it's one of these monstrously long PSR trains that can't fit in a siding, 
you have a roadblock on that territory that prevents any other train from possibly getting through. Sidetrack here, though, I would like to congratulate Mr. Robert Primus on his renomination to the Surface Transportation Board. I do look forward to hearing more of his questions in the years to come. So, we've talked about the trains and how they're being ran. How's the network doing in all of this? Yeah, that's a pretty good summary. It's been a completely disastrous 2022 for the railroads. It's been a disastrous 2022 for the economy, but uh, the railroads have had a lot to do with it, as you will soon see. Now, at first glance, it may be difficult to see the backup occurring in the national network, but one of the best ways to see this backup is through the Amtrak trains that run all over these important freight corridors in the national network. When you look at the performance of these Amtrak trains, you see, okay, there's an hour delay here, there's a two hour delay here, there's a three hour delay here, there's a four hour delay here, there's an eight hour delay here. You get the point. There are a lot of delayed trains that are being delayed by an ungodly number of hours. I may have to do an entire another video on Amtrak, but these delays are getting so bad that the long distance trains that are arriving into their terminals late, the successive departures in the other directions themselves, those departures are getting delayed by a numerous hours. When you look at the FRA data on Amtrak train delays, you start to see, oh my goodness, that is a lot of delays caused by host railroads. And then when you look further into the data, you see, oh my goodness, those are a lot of delays stacking up because of freight train interference. And what do you know? Look at the four biggest offenders, Union Pacific, BNSF, CSX, and Norfolk Southern. Okay, agreed. Those are the four host railroads that Amtrak travels the most on, but still. It's ridiculous. It is completely ridiculous for trains to be delayed by that much. It's simply unacceptable. And the disastrous start to 2022 gave us the Surface Transportation Board's emergency hearings on the urgent issues in freight railroading. You have already seen footage of train crewmen testifying to the board. You have seen railroad executives testifying to the board. However, one of the biggest focuses of these hearings was indeed the failures being described by the customers of these railroads. Watching these testimonies, you really do get an understanding of how these railroads have failed these industries and how because of all of that, it has led to an increase in inflation and how it has led to all consumers needing to pay more and more for basic needs. Unfilled grain car orders are the highest on record, highlighting how poor rail service has halted the movement of grain. Agricultural shippers are paying thousands of dollars extra per car just to get service, easily representing a 50 to 100 percent increase in cost. Elevators are full and cannot purchase more grain from farmers, and livestock operations are unable to receive the grain they need for feed. We've even heard that some producers have been so close to being unable to feed their livestock and poultry that they were preparing to depopulate their animals. That is something a farmer should never have to do. The FMC estimates that intermodal container shipments increased in this country last year by an astounding over 21% growth through our major port gateways. Unfortunately, the railroads have not been able to keep pace or take advantage of this growth. Case in point, last year, railroads saw a reduction of 16.8% of the intermodal rail service. This, again, at a time when intermodal container volumes surged to a 21% growth. During this time, one major West Coast Railroad halted rail service from the West Coast to Chicago for a week at the height of the volume surge. Another metered or reduced the scope of services. Still, the Union Pacific annual report for last year indicated that intermodal revenues had increased 3%. This is stunning. Think how much revenue was left on the table. Think how much could have been made if they'd broken even, or let alone increased market share. But even more than the, this issue, think of how much smoother and more efficient the supply chain could have run this past year if maritime surges uh, had been matched by rail efficiencies. 
One of our member companies experienced significant deterioration in rail service starting in Q4 of 2020. Since that time, average transit times have increased six days due to significant handling delays during transit. The variability of this transit is even worse, making it impossible for shippers to plan their business. At the same time, missed switches at destination for this company have increased 45%, causing rail cars to build up at destination, yet the railroads continue to charge demurrage and then eventually embargo a location, even when the railroads own missed switches were the cause of the backup. Another member company saw significant financial impact, over $30 million from lost production because of poor service. This location is dependent on rail service and a consistent supply of empty rail cars to meet their customers' needs. There has been no incremental production or increased rail demand, yet the railroad is no longer meeting the historic car order. The car order fill was 95% or better in January of 2020, and in early 2022, the car order fill is now around 40%. Another company reports one rail service provider's car order fill decreased from 94% in Q4 of 2020 to just 66% in Q1 of 2022. The same rail provider also significantly increased their missed switches from a total of 233 in 2019 to 339 in 2021 and already in 2022 has had 129 missed switches. Finally, for this company, this rail provider increased their transit time from 12 days in 2019 to 19 days in 2021. For this member company in just 2021, they lost over 45,000 tons of production due to mill downtime um, because of these issues. Another company reports during the end of Q3 through the beginning of Q1 of 2022, they experience weeks of multiple consecutive days without service, resulting in mill downtime or shutdown during a time, the holiday time, when customer demand was high. The rail provider did not have enough crew or rail cars to resolve the situation for over 60 days. You want to know how bad things are in the railroads? They're inadvertently harming the trucking industry. Yes, the trucking industry, one of the railroad's direct competitors. Yes, I'm dead serious. It was harming the trucking industry. Here is the CEO of Flying J, Shamit Konar, and his testimony to the STB. The service reduction allocations are being imposed by the Union Pacific Railroad. On April 13th, we were informed by the Union Pacific that we were required to reduce shipments by 26%. In subsequent conversations, we were asked to reduce them even further by 50% or face embargoes. We're not aware of any other company being instructed by the Union Pacific or any other railroad to reduce their shipments to the extent they're asking pilot. We understand through conversations with the Union Pacific that its allocations are based on a simplistic approach of looking at those shippers who have increased their number of shipments between January 2022 and March 2022. This does not take into account the overall number of shipments received at pilots facilities, which by the way, have remained static over this period. We believe the Union Pacific's approach does not fairly and proportionately allocate the supply issues because pilot has not increased the total number of cars it's received every month since January. What's actually happened is pilot has become a shipper for some cars that we were not shippers before. So our facilities are still receiving the same number of cars. It's just the name of whose shipping has changed because we've taken control over some of the cars because of the issues we've had with the railroads so that we have the optionality to deliver these cars and markets that they can take, right? So the total number of cars has stayed the same. We understand and appreciate that the current market conditions are imposing significant constraints on the railroads, and we're committed to help ease this congestion. However, 26 to 50% reduction in our allocations will have substantial consequences for the markets. I would like to take this opportunity to take you through a few of the consequences that Union Pacific's mandate will have on the supply chain, the availability of fuel, and fuel prices. First, let me talk about the DEF supply chain. And just as a reminder, we supply about 30% of the DEF in the United States. 
The trucking sector is dependent on DEF. All trucks manufactured after 2010 cannot operate without DEF. And Pilot operates, if not the largest, one of the largest DEF supply networks in the country. We have 23 rail served DEF facilities that make the DEF and we have 18 rail transloaders. Of the 300 plus million gallons of DEF that Pilot supplies to the industry every year, 74% is moved via rail. Union Pacific's restrictions will prevent Pilot from keeping many markets adequately supplied with DEF, likely causing shortages that'll sideline trucks and reduce trucking capacity. Let me give you some context. A single rail car carries 21,500 gallons of DEF on average, okay? A single truck generally takes in seven gallons of DEF every time they fill. This is based on that data. So that implies that a single rail car is basically providing 3,000 trucks worth of DEF fills. For some more context, basically every rail car that gets missed in terms of DEF delivery will reduce trucking potential by 5 million miles. All right, that's a really big number, 5 million miles, because you've got 3,000 fills and DEF blends with diesel at a ratio of 2.7%. 400 gallons, all right? So 2.7 gallons of DEF allow a truck to drive 100, uh, to use 100 gallons. Furthermore, a reduction in freight transported by the UP will only add additional pressure on the trucking sector in general. The railways are pulling back. We got to move the stuff on trucks. If we can't supply DEF, there's more pressure on the sector and we let the sector down. Second, fuel availability and pricing. Let me begin with diesel. US diesel inventories today are running 10 to 15% below what they have been in the last five years at their lowest point. So if you take the minimum diesel inventory over the last five years, today we're fit 10 to 15% below that number. Certain markets like the Northeast, the West and the Southwest are even in a worse shape than the rest of the country. Renewable fuels like biodiesel, renewable diesel move exclusively on rail, on ships, or on trucks, and there are no pipeline alternatives. Certain states like California are heavily dependent on the imports of renewable fuels that are generally transported on rail. Fourth, over 50% of pilots' renewable diesel is transported on rail, and having our capacity cut by 50% would actually increase fuel prices in these states and potentially run out some of these locations. From those examples, you can see just how far the railroad's failures have affected our economy and the world economy. So I do want to look at a number of these written testimonies in depth. And to find more of these written testimonies, you can go to the filings page that the Surface Transportation Board has on their website. And you can look on the filings for docket number EP 770. Among the filings, you can find testimony from the railroads, the railroads employees, the customers of the employees, and even some letters from members of Congress. Starting off, let's go ahead and cover energy. Let's look at the Tampa Electric Company and their difficulties with CSX and coal. Coal-fired electricity generated at Tico's Big Bend Power Station in Florida has been curtailed in light of severe rail shortages. The Big Bend facility is served by CSX Transportation. TECO has had a productive relationship with CSX in the past and appreciates the rail service provided by CSX during that time. However, the past few months have been full of CSX refusing and declining TECO's requests for rail service from the relevant Illinois coal mine to Big Bend. TECO originally requested delivery of several trains in March and three trains in April but CSX has only delivered one train in that entire time. CSX did so only after repeated refusals and Tico's formal letter of objection on March 25th. The cars for that train were picked up from Big Bend on April 7th and did not return loaded from the Illinois mine to Big Bend until April 22nd. Unfortunately, CSX has now refused all requests for service until June at the earliest, 
based on what CSX describes as continuing labor and congestion issues. As an explanation for the repeated refusals to provide service, CSX has stated that it is focusing on minimum tonnage agreements and customers who, in CSX's view, are in danger of running out of coal and are more dependent on coal than TECO. We are troubled by CSX's reduction in service based on their opinion of customer need. One train out of 10 over a three month period is unacceptable and unsustainable. TECO utilizes coal at the Big Bend facility to keep fuel costs low for customers when coal pricing is favorable to natural gas and to balance natural gas usage, which is limited by our existing natural gas transportation agreements and pipelines that are fully subscribed. To maintain reliable low-cost fuel supply at the Big Bend facility, TECO will need three or four more trains in May and each succeeding month. Without these trains, generation from the coal-fired unit has been and will be limited. Furthermore, CSX's inability to transport coal that TECO has under contract with the mine forces TECO to go to the market and try to secure higher cost power if natural gas is also unavailable. TECO may be required to buy power from the very utilities that CSX has deemed to be in need of or dependent on coal. This causes harm to our customers, harm to our inventory, and forces the curtailment of coal burn. In addition, CSX's failure to move our trains results in our rail assets sitting at Big Bend as an additional expense while not being utilized to move the coal so desperately needed at the facility. Next, we will go ahead and focus on some of the issues that the cement industry has been facing. Next, we have the Portland Cement Association and the letter from Steve Ambrose, the Vice President of Cement Sales and Logistics at GCC of America, who is here on behalf of the Portland Cement Association, representing the majority of the nation's cement manufacturers. Over the past year, many cement manufacturers have experienced significant declines in rail service that have hindered our ability to get our product to market in a timely manner. The cement industry relies substantially on railroads to deliver our product to the marketplace beyond the economical range of trucks. In addition, some cement plants also have access to water transportation for domestic shipments. These plants look to rail, barge, and trucks to transport their product. Most bulk cement shipment are from the manufacturing plants to the regional distribution terminals, where the cement is then delivered by truck to the distribution network consisting primarily of local contractors and ready-mixed concrete producers. In summary, the nation's cement manufacturers have historically relied heavily on rail transportation to move the majority of shipments between cement plants and distribution terminals, and that reliance has only grown in recent years. It is therefore absolutely critical to cement manufacturers that the railroads provide reliable, efficient, sustainable, and cost-effective service to meet the widespread and growing demand for our product. With this background, the cement industry is working to meet carbon neutrality by 2050 across the cement and concrete value chain. Cement manufacturers look to rail as a highly sustainable model of transportation to move their product to market as we work to achieve carbon neutrality. The overwhelming majority of cement manufacturing plants are captive to a single railroad. For example, west of the Mississippi River is dominated by two Class I railroads, BNSF Railway and Union Pacific, and their tracks typically do not parallel each other. East of the Mississippi River, CSX and Norfolk Southern are the two dominant Class I railroads. It is rare that a cement manufacturing plant is not captive to one railroad, as it is rare that rail lines parallel each other at or near the locations where cement plants exist. For example, GCC of America's cement plant in Odessa, Texas is captive to Union Pacific, and the closest BNSF track is located 129 miles east and 196 miles west of the plant. When the Class I rail carriers moved to precision scheduled railroading in recent years, cement manufacturers experienced a significant decline in service. Prior to this shift, cement manufacturers were already facing challenges with consistent service. The shift to precision scheduled railroading has resulted in a significant increase in missed switches and increased demurrage bills as more cars had to be added to runs to accomplish the same volumes prior. For example, in a manifest run that prior to precision scheduled railroading took seven days, now takes 10 days to accomplish the same volume. 
Collectively, this has led to increased costs to cement manufacturers not only through increased demurrage, but also lost sales. For example, not only is the above playing out in manifest shipments, it is also playing out in unit train service. Up until two years ago, and for the past eight years prior, GCC of America has run a 100-unit car train from Pueblo, Colorado to Denver, Colorado on seven-day average intervals. Two years ago, the interval changed to 10 days. Our records show the reasons given were lack of crews, locomotive availability, and in some cases both. As a result, GCC of America ran out of cement in the Denver market seven times in 2021. However, this does not just impact us. It is important to consider the impact to our customers and the construction of airports, highways, city streets, and then finally the average citizen who experiences delays and increased costs. Cement manufacturers have seen a further degradation in rail service over the past year. Many of the railroads point to staffing cuts and challenges associated with the COVID-19 pandemic. While large parts of the economy were impacted by various restrictions, construction in many cases remained in place as an essential activity, and in some cases volumes and demand for construction materials, including cement, increased as projects were accelerated due to reduced traffic levels on our roadways. This coincides with Class 1 freight railroads announcing further service cuts. Coupling the reduction in service through staffing cuts, precision scheduled railroading, and continued or increased demand for construction materials has left cement shippers in some very difficult situations of not being able to fulfill orders in a timely manner. At the beginning of the pandemic, there were many uncertainties. For example, the cement industry was concerned about a slowdown in construction, when in fact that did not happen. After initially scaling back service significantly, the Class 1 railroads have had ample time to hire enough workers to meet the continued and increasing demands for rail shipping. The time for the railroads to continue to point to reduced staff and service because of the COVID-19 pandemic has long passed. Next, we're going to focus on agriculture, specifically grain in North Dakota. With the war in Ukraine affecting grain supplies, it is important for the grain here in the United States to be expediently taken to ports and distributed. However, you will see that that is simply not happening. On behalf of the North Dakota Grain Dealers Association, which represents the interests of the commercial grain industry in the state of North Dakota, and their facilities are the primary point of sale for grain raised by North Dakota farmers. Rail service issues. The service issues plaguing North Dakota grain shippers include late car orders and delayed shipments along with missed train arrival or spot times, estimated times of arrival, and poor communication. We believe the reasons for these problems are related to railroad labor shortages, and while the service issues in North Dakota have not resulted in facilities being shut down, they have caused many excessive costs to shippers and created a critical labor issue for North Dakota grain elevators. Late car orders and delayed shipments. A few shippers are reporting BNSF DETs are six to seven weeks behind. One manager indicated that they were notified that a train ordered for March 7, 2022 will arrive on April 22, 2022. Shippers are reporting that single car orders that are over 30 days old are getting canceled. While cancellation may improve the railroad metric of orders not being over 30 days old, these orders have to be reordered, putting those shipments that much farther behind and costing the shipper untold amounts in the form of contract late delivery penalties, interest expenses, and lost sales. Some BNSF shippers had cars ordered for March, but didn't receive them until after April 1st, costing those shippers an extra eight cents per mile in fuel surcharge. Many BNSF shippers have cars ordered for delivery in April and are extremely concerned they will be delayed until after May 1st, when fuel surcharge goes to 47 cents per mile, adding an additional 27 cents per mile in costs. It should be noted that the grain and oilseed production in North Dakota was down about 20 to 25 percent in 2021 due to drought conditions. Had production not been drought reduced, the rail service issue would probably be much worse than it is. Estimated times of arrival. The main challenge shuttle loaders face is having the necessary personnel in place at the moment the shuttle arrives to be able to load, grade, and build the train in the time frame required by the tariff rules. The personnel needed are not only the elevator's employees, but also grain inspection services. In some locations of the state, 
Inspection services require many hours of advance notification to ensure their personnel can get to the elevator by the time the train is spotted. When an estimated time of arrival is missed, the elevator incurs the extra labor costs while employees and grain inspection personnel sit around waiting for the train to arrive. Other consequences include employees working extended hours without proper rest, employees working in unsafe conditions, and employees working erratic hours, giving up weekends and family time. These situations create employee morale issues, and the problem has become so pervasive that it has created a critical labor issue for North Dakota elevator managers. Compensation rates for elevator employees are becoming unsustainable, and even then, elevators are struggling to find qualified help. Employees are willing to give up pay in exchange for predictability and stable hours and are leaving elevators for lower paying jobs. And here are some of the recent reports. A manager reported tracking a train until it was six hours from the spot time, which would have been on a Tuesday afternoon. They started making the arrangements to get employees and grain inspection in place for when the train arrived and then had to put everything on hold as the spot time was moved back. The manager stated that the spot time changed 11 or 12 times during the course of that week and the train finally arrived five days later on Saturday with the result of the elevator employees working all weekend. Another report states that an elevator watched a train they were expecting to load stop 10 miles short of the interchange to pull the train into the spot. The elevator crew had already been sent home to rest because they were expecting to load at night. The train didn't move for 48 hours until a crew was sent out to move it the last 10 miles, requiring the train to be loaded during the weekend. Here is the last and most egregious report. This past Easter weekend, a manager reported a train was to be spotted at 10 a.m. on Easter Sunday. The manager made arrangements to have employees available to load the train, meaning none could travel for the holiday. The train was spotted 30 hours late at 3 p.m. on Monday afternoon. The issue of communication with the railroads goes hand in hand with the service issues we are experiencing. Lack of communication on the part of the railroads is probably the most common complaint of North Dakota shippers. Railroads expect their shippers to operate on a 24-7 basis, but are not available to address problems outside of normal work hours, and even then, it is very difficult to get answers. The following are recent situations. A manager reports being notified by the railroad on a Thursday that the train he was waiting for would be spotted on the following Monday. The railroad then, without notification to the manager, moved up the spot time to Saturday. The elevator did not have the personnel in place to load the train and incurred demurrage charges. A manager reported a situation where they had a loaded grain train waiting to be pulled and they tried for several days to get an answer on when they could expect the train to move. No communication came from the railroad until the shipper was notified that there was an empty train headed back to his location and that he was responsible for redirecting that train since it couldn't be spotted due to the loaded train not being pulled. In essence, the shipper was being penalized by the railroad for the railroad's own poor performance. Many managers report being able to track the empty freight they are slated to load right up until it gets within 100 to 200 miles from the facility. Once it hits a rail yard in the state, they lose the ability to track the freight and it may take several hours or days for the freight to move what should take just a few hours and it is very difficult to get communication from the railroad about when the train will spot at the facility. These are just a few recent examples of actual situations that have occurred here in North Dakota within the last few weeks or months, but they are by no means the only examples. There are dozens of these situations occurring every month. Each case was relayed to the North Dakota Grain Dealers Association by shippers with specific dates and times. We have made these examples generic so as not to put any one shipper in the position of being singled out. Currently in North Dakota, grain shippers accept all of the risk when making a grain sale. They guarantee delivery during a specific time frame and pay the penalty if the sale is late due to rail service issues. If a shuttle spot time is missed, the elevator makes the necessary adjustments and pays the extra personnel costs to ensure the train is loaded within time allotted by tariff rules. Railroads bear no other risk than some loss of revenue due to slower velocity. Perhaps it is time to shift some of the risk for non-performance back to the railroads. One suggestion would be to revise the rules for demurrage to allow shippers reciprocal charges for missed spot times and late car orders. 
Another suggestion is to require railroads to pay a portion of the penalties incurred when contract shipment deadlines are missed due to poor rail service. This final written testimony is from a sand producer in Wisconsin that utilizes rail services to distribute their product to Indiana. The sand producer utilizes a railroading practice known as reciprocal switching. It is a process by which a host railroad negotiates and contractually agrees to have another railroad use its trains on the host railroad's tracks to serve an industry or industries that would otherwise be captive to the host railroad. AF Geller Company Incorporated, located in Marquesan, Wisconsin, has been serving the foundry industry for over a hundred years, providing high quality silica sand. The customer at the receiving end, GRED, produces premier ductile, gray, and specialty iron casting, which automotive, industrial, and commercial trucking markets utilize. Customers include GM, Ford, Caterpillar, and the list continues. We take tremendous pride in saying we are the largest sand provider and want to continue holding them as a customer. However, due to the consistent and continuous issues we have experienced because of rail service, there is a direct threat to our ability to provide a stable supply of sand for GRED and for it to maintain production levels. For reference, the Newcastle, Indiana lane for Marquesan consists of the following. WSOR, Union Pacific, Belt Railway of Chicago, Norfolk Southern, NCS. The usual transit time was 10 to 12 days, but beginning in February of 2022, it is now at an unacceptable 20 to 26 days. The issues began with the Belt Railway Company of Chicago. Congestion on the BRC is preventing the Union Pacific from switching our cars in a timely manner. Cars sit in Butler or Granville, Wisconsin on the UP, waiting until BRC approves the switch. The average idle days from October of 2021 through January 2022 were 1.189, but starting in February of 2022, the average idle time is now 3.896 days, with the highest idle time being 8.135 days. Once on the BRC, our cars are switched to Norfolk Southern, which takes our cars to the final short line in Newcastle, Indiana, the Newcastle Southern Railroad. Since February of 2022, the NS's service is completely unsatisfactory. The usual route for cars is as follows, clearing Illinois, Elkhart, Indiana, Fort Wayne, Indiana, Muncie, Indiana, then on the NCS to Newcastle, Indiana. To help with congestion at the Elkhart, Indiana terminal, NS has been rerouting cars to other states, far out of route. For example, a rail car went from Elkhart to Ohio, then Pennsylvania, back to Ohio, then to New York, back to Ohio, only to return to Elkhart. The unnecessary rerouting caused a 15-day delay. The total transit time for Marquesan, Wisconsin to the destination of Newcastle, Indiana was a staggering 26 days. Other cars have traveled from Elkhart to Ohio, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and then returned to Elkhart, while others from Elkhart are rerouted to Ohio, New York, Ohio, and back to Elkhart. These issues have caused extensive delays, twice causing customer shutdown. From the NS's customer service response time, or shall I say lack thereof, it is clear to us our issues are of no concern to NS. I spoke to NS's business development manager about my concerns. Although this employee listened, no further action was taken by the NS, nor was any explanation given. Since the NS increased its rate on this lane in the beginning of 2022, transit times have doubled and service substantially declined. We are concerned this is not a short-term situation, but that this has become permanent. These delays have costed an additional thousands of dollars to AF Gelhar in trucking costs to ensure GRED receives the necessary sand to continue production. It is imperative GRED receives product in a timely manner to meet customer requirements and uphold their commitments to customers. They seriously took a car all the way to New York and back when the car had absolutely no business whatsoever being in New York. How is this precise? How is this good scheduling? How is this good railroading? It is none of those three. 
In general, the customers of railroads are facing widespread issues such as increased fees that are being levied by the railroads, increased delays, bad communication with the railroads, and in the case of the grain workers in North Dakota, they end up having to work the odd hours that the railroaders do. So with all of these instances of customers of the railroads being failed, it is worthwhile that we take a look at the leadership of these railroads. Yes, we're gonna take a look at some executives. Like executives in other industries, railroad executives are tasked with communicating with customers, communicating with investors, as well as handling, in general, the business. While you do see the trains and the train crews on a daily basis, it is the executives that are carrying out the business. For example, we have James Foote, CEO of CSX. Here's James Foote appearing on Mad Money with an oddly enthusiastic Jim Cramer. Now, uh, we've always liked the railroads of the show. We always felt that look, they, they're green, they use less oil, we know that they have very little competition among the other railroads, so they have competition among trucks. But what we never expected was that they were not cyclical, that there's just an upward trend. That's what I feel you've made with CSX. How'd you do it? Well, you know, Jim, we've been transforming CSX now for the last two years, two and a half years, uh, using a different model. It's focused on really running the railroad as efficiently as we possibly can, using as few assets as we possibly can. And the end result of that is that we provide a much, much more reliable product. But we're also able to pivot much better, too, when the, uh, you know, because the railroad business is the railroad business, changes all the time, uh, factors here, factors right. there. So we're able to move uh, in any direction we need to at any given time much better. Okay, so what's different? Are you more on time? Are you not losing cars all over the place? Or are, are, are you telling customers that you can do X and then you do even better than X? Absolute horror stories of the way the railroad right. industry has run for years and years and years, not providing a very good product whatsoever for our customers. By focusing on, again, efficiency, what we're really meaning is in the supply chain, in our logistics chain, there are so many unnecessary things that were done. Switching boxcars here where they didn't need to be, stopping and holding cars in a yard where they didn't need to be, all kinds of work along the way that wasn't necessarily to be done in order to move your customer's product from their mill to their customer as efficiently and as reliably as you possibly can. Now, if all of that talk sounds familiar, it's because it's all of the same PSR sales talk that you've been hearing from other railroads ever since 2015. And again, in a vacuum, it's okay to run your trains more efficiently, but it becomes problematic when at some point you are just gambling with reliability and safety. Now, in a much different tone, here is James Foote again, but this time, he is at the emergency STB hearings, and he is indeed being questioned by Robert Primus on why his railroad is failing the country. I said it to NS, and I'll say it to you, and I'll say it to everybody else tomorrow. Uh, it's, a, you know, the buck stops with you. It's important that you're here. It's important that your, your customers hear from you, uh, not just your customers, but, but us also on, on the way forward. Uh, like I said, Jamie and uh, Deanna did a great job. But, uh, you know, you're the one that pulls the levers. And, uh, you know, I, I, I really want to hear sort of your, where, where you think that uh, we're going with uh, your commitment to uh, restoring service and, and to the customers, because it's important for us to, to understand that. I mean, I got some other questions for you, but I want to start, start there. Sure. Um, we have... Uh, we have struggled, we have underperformed, um, as we have worked our way through the last two years of going into and out of, uh, or I don't even know if we're out of the pandemic yet. Our case counts, uh, our case counts are up now about 25% over the last two weeks. So, um, so, um, and, uh, but we have worked, we have worked like dogs, uh, not the management, not just the management team, but every employee at CSX has worked like a dog to, uh, 
to to uh, do the best job they could under unbelievably uh, unbelievable circumstances to meet the needs of our customers. And I'd like you know once in a while I'd like somebody to say you know hey you know you guys did a great job. Um, and we are finally making the turn, and we are coming out of this. And as uh, as uh, Jamie said, uh, our numbers in terms of where we are in our hiring is uh, we're on track to be in the next three or four months uh, back to where we were in uh, 2019, early 2020, when the company was performing at record levels. Uh, uh, velocity dwell, the numbers you guys put out to measure whether or not the railroad was performing well. We're still, despite all of this, leading the industry despite the difficult uh, challenges. So we're going to get back to where we were in 2019, and then we can begin to improve upon that. That's not where we. That's not the end game. That's just to get back so where we, where we were, so we can get better. And uh, and it's been a challenge, but uh, this team has uh, pulled together, and uh, we're on track uh, to be able to perform uh, back at those record industry leading levels uh, in months, not years. Um, you know, you, you need to, uh, and you need to be careful about, you know, we don't, there's no other reason. There is no other reason why the company is not performing other than we do not have conductors on the trains. You want an answer? Let us yeah, run the I trains. Mean, let us run the trains with one employee and, you, and the issue is solved. If you want to double the number of trains and run shorter trains at double the number of trains, you're going to need twice as many employees. Yeah, so that's a way to start things. Number one, we've been working like dogs. And then number two, you want to improve things? Let us run with one person in the cab. Uh, interesting of him to say that right then and there, but okay, we'll let him continue. Simple as that. You talk about turning trip optimizer off because you don't want to use cruise control, high, uh, high technology to run the locomotives. Uh, that's not going to solve the problem. The, the the delay, it's not like we're, you know, running the train 60 miles an hour, 70 miles an hour, 80 miles an hour to go from terminal to terminal and it gets to the terminal and there's nobody to get on the next train and go. Great. Still going to have the same amount of average velocity across the railroad. It's not going to improve it. We all need to get people on the locomotives. That's the problem. We're working on it. We're addressing it and we'll be there in a matter of months, not not years. So I appreciate, I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, I, I appreciate that. Um, you know, you, you, there's a couple of things I want to follow up on. I mean, you, you spoken uh, in the recent past that it's not about the OR anymore. Uh, it's about growth and, and, you know, it, to me and, you know, listening to some of the folks, uh, the investor groups earlier on and some of the others, I mean, the, the challenge is how can you grow? Uh, you know, if you don't have, you know, the, the people and you don't have the capacity. And right now there, there's a challenge on, on, on both. And I, I think I, I want to get your comments on, on that, but also the fact that, you know, I, I've been telling people that slack matters. And, and I think, you know, this race to the OR and you say you're not focused on it now, I'm, I'll take your word at for it. But at one point, everyone was focused on lowering the OR. And, and uh, you know, I, I come from more, you know, I was on Capitol Hill, spent 25 years, and I focused a lot on military. And I'm sure you're aware of, you've heard of the term military readiness and capability. And even when we're not at war, uh, uh, you know, we take great care not to cut our, our military to the bone. Because if something like a 9-11 happens and we're cut to the bone, we can't respond in a way that we need to respond. But I can tell you wholeheartedly, we responded exactly the way we, we were supposed to respond right after that because we, we were ready and we had the capability and we were ready to go. Uh, you know, you look at the railroad uh, network now and you realize that leading up to COVID, we were cutting dangerously close if not already to the bone. And you were operating well, I'll give you credit, you were operating well in that, but we were, you were still cutting, cutting people to the point where when we hit this surge, we didn't have the capacity to, to, to come back. And, and you, you, I've heard from Jamie and others say that, you know, it's hard to hire people. Well, the other part is, you know, the industry hasn't been treating folks 
very well. I mean, the labor unions were very clear on that earlier on, saying that there's a lot of challenges out there. There's a lot of attrition and people, you know, you got this new generation doesn't that 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 wants new things. And the question is, how are we going to going to get that? You know, I, you, your letter from last year, the 17th, talked about how you guys are going to be, you know, you guys will be in good shape by the end of last year. Uh, you know, you're close to it. But you still had, we still have challenges. One of the reasons why we're here now. I mean, you know, the reality is we got to figure out where we can find that readiness sweet spot. I've been tell, talking about that. I mean, and where you can have a little bit of slack in your employment that you can, ha that we don't keep going on, on roller coaster rides every, every few years. So, you know, we're riding high one time and then we cut. Next thing you know, we're, we're, we're in, a, in a valley and we're, we're struggling to get out of it. So uh, my question is, you know, do, do, would you agree that, you know, we need to sort of have a sweet spot of employment, so a good level that, you know, yeah, we can carry some slack in good times or in bad times, but we have that slack ready, that readiness, that, that if something, uh, some shock to the system comes or some, some surge that we can handle it without having to go into a meltdown or into some sort of shock, would you agree that, that we need to, you know, not just a sweet spot for, 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 uh, from a from a um, employment, but even from an OR standpoint, you know, there, how low, you know, I I, I don't want to see us keep going lower and lower with OR because I don't think we can get out of it once we get to a certain point. You know, is there a sweet spot in OR that we need to hit, and should we maintain that? I do not believe that it's appropriate to institutionally uh, institutionalize or mandate uh, artificial. Uh, artificial metrics on how an industry should be operated. I started in this business 50 years ago uh, uh, when the railroad industry had been artificially uh, and institutionally mandated on what they were supposed to do and how much they could charge and how they do, who they served, when they served. No, I'm, not, I'm, not talking about, I'm not talking about necessarily artificial. So, Jim, I'm not talking about artificial. Case. I'm not talking about artificial. Well, right? I'm just saying there's, there's, there's got to be, have, there's gotta have, be a well, sweet spot. We don't operate to an operating ratio. That's not, we don't say, oh, we're going to have an operating ratio and this is what it's going to be. We set a budget. We set a three-year strategic plan based upon what our revenue opportunities are and what the realistic costs are for us to be able to deliver uh, based upon the market demand for rail service, the market demand for pricing like any other industry or business would do. And your costs are what your uh, costs are. It's not artificial. And then you have to generate cash from that in order to spend $2 billion plus to put back in the railroad. So just so you can start next year where you ended this year by putting rail ties and ballast in, none of this is artificial. Well, yeah, I, course, I hate, I hate to, I hate to cut you up, Jim, Jim, but, but your, your ORs, too, when you talk, start talking to your investors, you sum up, this is where we're going in OR. Our, our operating ratio is going up. I mean, hey, it's uh, public information. You can look it up. Our operating ratio is going up. We made strategic investments in a railroad and a trucking company, and our operating rate ratio went up. It's public information. It is public information. I'm asking you, it's like it's not, it's not artificial. But before you got to that point, you were going down. It was how low can you go? And you were telling investors. It was, it was going down because we were improving the way the company operated. We were uh, changing the methodologies the way the op uh, company operated, and the railroad was operating with a higher level of efficiency. When the railroad, when you take out all the inefficient, unnecessary touches in the way we do business, guess what happens? You take out costs and you improve the service of the railroad. That's why our trip plan compliance, our reliability, our on-time performance were all at record levels while the well, operating the, the, the problem is down. when you got, when, but, but when you get punched in the face like you did in COVID, it should, you, you should be resilient enough to be able to respond to it and you didn't. And now you're well, we, we were, we out. Have. So obviously, obviously, you didn't make enough of a calculation to to, to put yourself. You're, right. in you're absolutely right, and I've suggested this to you before. Even though last time you said when I brought up the pandemic, that was a red herring. We have contingency plans in everything we do. We plan for hurricanes. We plan for floods. We plan for how to run the railroad in the winter. We, you know, 20 degrees in Erie, Pennsylvania on the same day, it's 90 degrees in the Southern Florida. We plan for that. We have contingency plans. We have extra boards. We have equipment parked all over the railroad, generators, trucks, equipment to cut trees down, to go in and keep the railroad operating. You're absolutely right. 
Did we have a pandemic plan and how to run the railroad without people? No. But you didn't also have a recovery plan either. Yeah. Well, I just I just articulated it to you. Simple as that. I just so, told you. So my, my question, my question is up. once again, my question is once again, understanding that lesson learned, is there is there a, a target employment number that you guys are gonna go to you guys are gonna target in the future? You guys talk about how you're planning all in the future. You want to operate. You want to do all this other stuff. And I'm glad you say that you have contingency plans for weather because I don't want to hear another weather excuse going forward since you guys got those in place. The issue is, are you going to have a, a labor plan in place so we don't have to go roller coaster riding all over again? You know, we go up, we go down, so you can have people in place a slack group. Of yes, we do. Uh, you know, it'd be it'd be extremely difficult to put together a budget and try to run this company without a manpower plan. How many people we're going to need in order to execute on what we're going to do? Of course, we have that. So, what's that number for this year? No, no, I'm not asking. If a plan, a strategic plan, is not just this year; it's future years out. So, what's your plan? What what's what's your number? That's an unrealistic question. I guess I'm asking because uh, it's kind of unrealistic of what's going on right now in the in the in the, in the industry. You know, we we got the, there's a there's a you 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 tell your customers that you need to have a plan in place to help so we can so we can plan in the future, but you don't have a plan in place. So so when when you fall down, they you know, that's you know come on we have to do this again, but this is the third time I've gone through this kind of uh, conversation over and over and over again. Well, because well, we we have. I wasn't. I came here. I came here out of courtesy. I came here because it's important. I came here because the customers were going to talk. I sat in a room all day because I wasn't allowed in here. My team was given a good presentation, and I'm going through the same over and over and over questions. That no matter what, you don't you don't want the answer. I do want an answer because we get the same over and over from from customers saying that that they're not getting the answers. So I've got to ask them. Over and over again until we get some answers, the right answers anyway. Yeah, I can give you a projected headcount number. Do I know right now that it's 19,786 employees or 20,211? I don't know that. I'm sorry. I can tell you what our growth projection is for next year, and I'll tell you what our headcount is going to be, what we're going to need. Is that what you want? That's exactly what I want. I mean, Perfect. I'll give it to you tomorrow. I mean, as, as a head of the company, you should know. Especially want to get out of this problem, we should know what's going on. That's why I asked you to sit down at the table. Honestly, you should have sat at the table in the first place. I wasn't invited. You were invited. Your 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 letter didn't invite the CEOs. So look at your letter. Mr. Mr. Chairman, last time I checked, it said uh, uh, you know chief executives. I don't think so. Look it up. Well, you like should, I said, it's, you your, it's your company. It's your company. It's your customers who are who are hurting right now. Well, you should know you're on the board. I am. Go look it up. And I'll give you the headcount numbers for the next three years. Tomorrow. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Robert. It said senior executives. That's what it said. We, we, I think he's a senior well, executive, too. We, I agree. Okay, that may have been the most combative 15 minutes of a surface transportation board hearing that I have ever seen in my entire life. There's a lot to unpack from that entire sequence, but I will start out by saying that Mr. Foote began his railroading career with the Sioux line in the blue collar trades. Now, given that he started off in the trades and ended up with whatever the heck we just saw, you would wonder how that's even possible. Simple, E. Hunter Harrison. He was literally his right-hand man at Canadian National. If E. Hunter Harrison is the father of precision scheduled railroading, then James Foote is essentially the son of PSR. If you're wondering, James Foote was the only Class 1 CEO to show up to testify at the Surface Transportation Board hearings. All of the other Class 1s just sent their own envoys of smug-looking bean counters. 
Now, at one point in the railroads, it was the exception that people with no railroad experience were inside the business aspect of the railroads. But now in the business and executive branches of the railroads, that is essentially the norm. All throughout the years, we have seen the portion of railroad executives that had worked in the trades and operations and all of the boots on the ground jobs for the railroads. That portion of the railroad executive pool has just gotten smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. As we have seen railroad management shift from a focus on railroad experience to a focus on business experience in terms of people they are looking to hire, the railroads have suffered. The market share in the country held by the railroads has shrunk. The service to the customers has fallen apart. However, there is one aspect of the railroads that has flourished. The financial model is working, however, as evidenced by the, uh, the announcements of massive stock buybacks at the same time that service is dismal. Investor analysis after analysis continues to be bullish on the large freight rail suppliers, and they do not seem to assign much of any risk to future earnings associated with poor service. Just pause and think about that statement for a minute. And, you know, I, I wrote these notes on Saturday as I was thinking about this hearing. And then on Monday, I came into my office and I had an email in my inbox. And it was from one of the large U.S. banks that analyzes uh, the freight rail industry. And here's the headline. Proposed emergency service rules are unlikely to cause meaningful risk to the railroads. That's remarkable. That's right. Wall Street. Wall Street and the investment banks are perhaps the railroad's biggest problem of all. Now, stock ownership isn't inherently problematic, but when we get into the world of stock options and hedge funds, oh dear, now we're running into issues. With the Staggers Act in 1980, speculative interest in the railroads flourished, and we have seen what that has resulted in with the introduction of PSR in 2015. However, these speculators just got plain greedy. Case in point, trying to beat economic cycles, like you heard Jim Cramer talk about earlier in that interview with James Foote. What's especially alarming is to see the compensation packages for these railroad executives. They are chock full of these stock options for their own railroads. And what have the railroads been doing in mass? They have been buying back their own stock to the tune of over $190 billion since 2010 over $190 billion. That is remarkable. All the while you have railroad executives deflecting blame. Meanwhile, they're effectively paying themselves massive bonuses by buying back stock of their own company, raising up the value in the stock options in their compensation packages. There's plenty of money. I know you guys have plenty of money to do it. You're spending more on buybacks than you are on, on capital expenditure, so I think you know, you should seriously look at the, that operations in terms of how you want to expand that network and grow that network so you can, in turn, grow velocity. Well, and this year is an example to that exact point. Um, you know, last year we had $300 million in our capacity and commercial facility budget. We increased that 100%. So there is $600 million in there this year. Uh, it does not just include siting extensions. It's a, That's about 25% of the spend. It also includes portions of double track, uh, to your point, in certain areas that uh, are bottlenecks or that we believe, based on our volume growth, could become bottlenecks. So I agree with you. Okay, good. We'll tell Lance that. You have to buy that money back. I do, I do think we want to be clear, though. We do spend more in capital than we do on stock buybacks. We were clear uh, about that in our earnings release. How much did you spend last year in, in capital expenditures? Three point what? Three point one billion. How much did you give in buybacks last year? It was one point two. Is that the right number? No, it's total. I got it on your oh. total is almost uh, eight. Uh, a little bit, a little bit more than that. It's a little bit more than that. Great. I was quote, quoting a quarterly number. I apologize for that. Okay, because I was around. I was around seven billion. So wasn't that from, from, from that? I mean, I've seen the press releases on it. So, I mean, that's a big I difference. No, I apologize. I was quoting a quarterly number. That's my mistake. Okay. Uh, a mistake taken. But I think the idea is that 
is spending a lot more and giving it back to, people, to, to your shareholders and putting it into the investing it in there, especially when you have you know, these service issues. It is simply a nauseating conflict of interest that is not being properly pointed out. And you know who isn't pointing out these management failures? Wall Street itself. During the hearings, we actually had testimony from two speculators, one from Loop Capital and the other from JP Morgan. It was simply predictable that Mr. Patterson would point out that there were not enough train crews and that that was the single biggest issue that the railroads were facing. Did they point out that there were crew and power issues? Yes, but they were not acknowledging what led up to those issues. They were not acknowledging that they had indeed, along with all of the other speculators and the railroad executives, they didn't point out that they had been profiting for years because of the railroad operating models. I will commend Mr. Patterson for this particular moment of honesty, let's call it. If I can, if you're going to indulge me in an overgeneralization, uh, regulatory activism is something that is not usually welcome on Wall Street, or at least not by the Wall Street Journal. Uh, but in the situation that we are facing today, would a little regulation to help as you put it, unlock the railroads, possibly be greeted with some forgiveness by Wall Street? No. <laughs> <laughs> and, under no circumstances, no. <laughs> no, no, I think I've, I think I've come off a... <laughs> I think I've come off a couple of Christmas card lists myself today, so... We're in the same boat. I will take a moment to say that the Surface Transportation Board is not entirely innocent in all of these matters. It is true that the railroads and the regulators were playing a big game of cat and mouse over the years, but as Chairman Oberman recently said, We have a lot on our plate, and the people who've been around the STB for a long time tell me that the past year has probably been the most intense of year in the last 20 years. Uh, given the, the merger, the supply chain, and uh, all of the other issues swirling ar around us. When the most active year out of 20 is the one where everything is in complete freefall, it is a clear indication that there simply has not been enough regulation and attention paid to the railroads. Anyways, back to the speculators, it is interesting to see Mr. Rick Patterson's own stock valuations in this presentation. You see here, he has hold then buy ratings, he has hold ratings here, hold ratings there, um, buy and hold ratings there, and then buy ratings, and then some more hold then buy ratings here. And it is true that we didn't get to see the finer points of this PowerPoint, but if you go ahead and look at the very last page, during the STB hearings themselves, Mr. Patterson just simply glanced through this. We didn't even get a chance to read anything. If you look at the fine print, you see, oh my goodness. Union Pacific is literally a financial customer of Loop Capital. They have literally received financial services from Loop Capital within the past 12 months, and they intend to do so in the future. On the other side of things, we had a presentation from J.P. Morgan's Brian Osenbeck, who said many of the same things that Mr. Patterson did of Loop Capital. Once again, pointing out that there were simply not enough crew, and we're going to discuss that very soon. In more recent developments, diesel prices have increased, and that has started to affect the railroads and their financial outlook, and investment firms are starting to take note. In fact, just recently, we had a downgrade of Union Pacific by J.P. Morgan, and oh, oh, that's funny. Look who in fact downgraded it after he indeed made an entire big presentation to the Surface Transportation Board. It's that same presenter, Brian Osenbeck. Tying back into the hedge funds and speculators, let's go ahead and play a little game, and I encourage you to pause the video when I show these charts to you. All right, you ready? Okay, here is the stock ownership chart for Union Pacific. Okay, now moving on. Here is the stock ownership chart for Norfolk Southern. All right, now here's the stock ownership chart for CSX. Moving on, here's the stock chart for Canadian Pacific. 
And finally, here is the stock ownership chart for Canadian National. Now, if you paid attention, you would have seen that there were a number of recurring names in the top 10 shareholders for all of these railroad companies. And as you saw, a big portion of the top 10 holders of railroad stock are indeed hedge funds. Really, really big hedge funds. I mean, geez, look at BlackRock and then look at Vanguard. They are multi-billion dollar hedge funds. It's difficult to describe things other than, indeed, the railroads are being held hostage by Wall Street. And in effect, the entire American economy is being held hostage by Wall Street. Amid record profits and stock buybacks by the railroads and exceptional pain felt by the consumers and the American economy as a whole, there is an incalculable pain felt by one of America's proudest labor traditions, the railroad workers. To give some more insight, once again, here is railway labor attorney, Rich Edelman. I've represented rail unions for 35 years, and this is the worst labor relations and more importantly, most employee relations environment over those years. And that's saying something because I started in the period of abandonments, line sales, losses of tens of thousands of jobs, a presidential emergency <laughs> board report that dramatically changed collective bargaining agreements, and frankly, use of ICC transactions to circumvent agreements. So why are things worse now? Because back then, rail labor may have been upset at what was happening, much of which was improper, some of it unlawful, but the industry was in economic extremists. In recent years, we've seen tens of thousands of jobs cut, degradation of the jobs that remain, circumvention of collective bargaining agreements, wage stagnation at a time of record profits. As shown by our economist, Thomas Roth, since 2004, since the implementation and full integration of the big mergers, the class ones for real profits have increased 479%. The composite stock prices of the big three publicly traded class ones increased 1,359%. I actually put an exclamation point, which I don't normally do as a lawyer, but oh my God, that's a four digit percent increase. Profits per employee increased 979%. By comparison, during this period, real wages are only up 14%. Now, yesterday, Ms. Sanborn from Norfolk Southern, I'm pointing because she was over there, said Norfolk Southern talked about a balance of how resources are allocated. Well, that's just words. What I just read to you, that's how they do the balance. Now, all of this escalated as the class ones moved to the new business model. And stunningly, it continued into the pandemic. Since the start of the pandemic, traffic has returned to 97% of 2019 levels. But employment is down 19% from December 2009 to the present. 97% of the car loadings, 19% lower employment. The class ones have attempted to blame the pandemic for their staffing problems saying, well, we're encountering the same problems as all of these other businesses. Uh, Mr. Foote compared their problems to the difficulties that Starbucks is having baristas. Now, my daughter applied for a job at Starbucks. They gave her a couple of hours of training. That's a ludicrous comparison. Whatever the difficulties, other industries are having filling positions. Most didn't go on a job cutting spree prior to the pandemic. The staffing problem is not something that happened to the class ones. It's a problem they deliberately created. And I wasn't going to dwell on this given, you know, the chairman's request that we not be repetitive, but I heard the railroads repeat this lame deflection yesterday. And I can't let that go by unanswered. I mean, what they said yesterday is, well, let's just say disingenuous. All that stuff from Norfolk Southern and CSX about algorithms and forecasting and use of social media to recruit people and geographic specific focus and reference to general BLS statistics on the economy, this all ignores the brutal job cuts done in, in this industry that happened prior to the pandemic. And all this talk about hiring incentives and bonuses and gift cards wouldn't have been necessary if the carriers hadn't gutted the existing workforce. Look, let's put it this way. You don't repair damage done with a sledgehammer with a screwdriver. Now, I'll just say this. The statements I heard yesterday were insulting to the workforce and frankly insulting to this board. 
I also want to address the rote expressions of gratitude to the workers for their dedication during the pandemic. You should know that at the bargaining table, they say those same workers are overpaid abusers of health insurance. As Peter Kennedy from the BMWE had said, we've seen a 1,000% increase in thank yous for your service and a 0% increase in pain. Um, as explained in our papers, rail jobs are skilled jobs that require at least multiple months of training, followed by years of learning, and in some cases can take up to 10 years to reach full competency. The suggestion that railroads can fix the problems caused by deliberate program job cuts <laughs> pursuant to the mindless cost cutting is simply, and hiring off the street, it, it's a fantasy. In the meantime, 81% of the pre-pandemic workforce is moving 97% of the pre-pandemic freight and profits are up 9%. What does that tell you? 2021 operating revenue was about the same as 2019. So the class ones have increased their profitability, not through growth, but continuing cuts in expenses significantly and substantially in the workforce. And the rail workers haven't had a pay increase in nearly three years. Now, why does this matter to you? You're not a labor relations agency and we don't want you to be one, but you are an agency charged with promoting safe and efficient rail system, fair wages, safe and adequate, uh, suitable working conditions, sound economic conditions. And these obligations are implicated by what's been happening with rail employment. And we and the other unions have documented this. The railroads can't hire people who are leaving mid-career. In my 35 years, I, I never heard anybody with eight, 10, 12 years of time in on the uh, railroad leaving. Patrick, you asked me, asked yesterday, what could be done about staffing in the near term? Now, some of this is not what the board can do. The railroads can enter new agreements that finally share the wealth with the workers that generate the wealth. And that would halt the hemorrhaging of experienced employees leaving. People are leaving these jobs and you, we've given you statements in the record and I'm gonna read a couple of them. Um, I also have to say, listening to Ms. Adams yesterday, NSR is either fooling itself or attempting to fool you. But I can say one thing for sure, it's not fooling the employees and the unions. All this marketing and media stuff, it isn't gonna change the reality of the rates of pay and rules and working conditions. And as for Ms. Adams talk about the compensation and benefits that our people receive, well, you know, let's point out that the current rates of pay haven't increased in three years. And the health plan that she touted, they're trying to diminish that health care. Other thing she didn't mention was any significant pay raise, nor did Ms. Sorfleet from CSX. Now the railroads are fond of market-based solutions when they deal with the shippers and they tout the market when they're dealing with investors. So the market solution for their employment problems would be to give people better pay and benefits. But when it comes to their employees, they're blind to that. The CSX has patted itself on the back in front of you about the $600 a month advance. This is an advance that they're giving, but you have to pay back when there's retro pay. CSX talked about its collaboration with the unions and then, you know, I don't know what they're talking about, you know, I mean, certainly not with my clients. And, and last night, after CSX's speakers talked about collaboration, Mr. Foote said, oh, the crew problems could be solved by putting one person on a train. I guess they're gonna have one person driving a three mile long train. Um, I don't represent the operating crafts, I, I, so I want to address the merits. I just want to note that with one comment, Mr. Foote undercut the entire programmed speeches they made to you about relations with labor. Now, none of this is for the board to resolve. That's for the carriers to figure this out, for the National Mediation Board, a presidential emergency board, and maybe Congress. But you should know where this stands and know the truth of it when you deal with the question of retention of the workforce and recruitment of new employees. Now, you may be familiar with the attendance policy scandal that BNSF faced earlier this year and the national attention and backlash that that got. What you may not know is that conditions have been as bad or even worse at all of the other class one railroads. Here is Mark Wallace of the Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers and Trainmen. You can't attract new employees with the instability created by the PSR model. Nor can you attract new employees when the carriers are making an all-out assault to eliminate the positions that those employees are being hired for. Managers stating that one-man one crews are here, conductors will be in a truck, 
the trucks are already purchased and eventually no one will be on the train does not attract candidates seeking a career. The current manpower shortage certainly could and should have been avoided. However, PSR requires extreme leanness, which means furloughing employees to rock bottom staffing and forcing the remaining employees to work without scheduled days off, without paid sick days, without access to true FMA, FMLA leave and under threat of termination. The specific goal of PSR in this regard is to ensure that the small group of survivors perform to the level of a much larger workforce by denying most time off and implementing intolerable attendance policies. The carrier's continual mismanagement of its self-inflicted undersized workforce is a major factor in the current rail service problems. Due to the mismanagement, train and engine service employees working through, rates, through freight service are often required to stay away from home for more than 24 hours, laying over sometimes between 20 and 30 hours before being called to return home on a 12 hour trip. Our written record provides a more detailed example wherein a CSX crew was on duty for 23 hours and 30 minutes. This crew spent 12 hours looking for a hotel room, all under the management's direction. Our members are often only home for 12 hours before being called to perform service back to the away from home terminal. Imagine being at work for 40 hours, home for 12, gone for 40 hours, home for 12, with this cycle continuing 24 hours a day. Making matters worse are train lineups created by the railroads, which theoretically indicate an estimated time when the employee would return to work based on the train traffic that was planned to operate over the segment of the railroad. These lineups are paramount to crews being rested when called to perform service. The example in our written comments provided from a UP safety hotline report illustrate the frustration all employees feel because the li these lineups are not accurate or precise. What is shocking is that the railroads were the birthplace of the unionized labor movements in America. And because of that early unionization, railroad jobs were seen as the penultimate blue collar jobs. This was a profession that was proudly carried on throughout families. You can hear stories of third generation railroaders, fourth generation railroaders, fifth generation railroaders. But what is happening now? People are fleeing the craft. People are fleeing the railroads. Railroad worker parents are telling their children not to become railroad workers. And while all this is going on, you have ignorant comments saying, oh, well, if you don't like the job, then just go find another one. Yeah, well, guess what? People are doing that. People are doing that in mass. People are fleeing the railroads. There is no way that my words could properly discuss the pain that these railroad workers are facing. So I would encourage you to look at the comments to the Matt Burkhardt testimony that I posted, as well as the BNSF video that I did. And along with that, I would encourage you to read some of the articles that I will be linking in the description of this video. If there is one underlying message to what the railroads are doing, it would be this. The abuse perpetrated by the railroad companies destroys the lives of railroad workers and their families. Ever since 2020, the rail unions were in labor negotiations with the railroads. And ever since then, they have been working on an expired contract. They had been through national mediation with the railroads, but those negotiations failed. For a little more insight into the contract negotiations, here is BNSF conductor and YouTuber Rails, Tails, and Trails. The head honcho who's bargaining for the multiple carriers with our national unions and representatives, one of their offers was they wanted to do increase our pay with back pay by a total of 11% and they've been stonewalling because they want to reduce their their contribution to our health care benefits. So you take a sum on it, I believe is 7% yearly inflation with an 11% raise over five years. That's like 2.2 or 2.4% a year with reduction, them reducing what they're paying into our health healthcare benefits increasing our contribution that actually comes as a pay cut and they they've been stonewalling in mediation with bs excuses i guarantee if these guys took and gave a serious offer to our unions based off the offer and the conditions our unions have presented them and actually 
negotiated, they could have this thing done like that, but they don't want to. Our unions are ready to make a deal, but it has to be a good one. It has to be fair. And it, it needs to be approved by the members for what everybody out here working deserves to have. They do this stonewall tactic for years and they're continuing to do it while they're saying, oh, it's, you know, it takes time. Yeah, it takes time. They're stonewalling. Why? They want one man crews on the bill. They want it in the contract. He was covering the STB hearings before I was, along with various other railroad topics. I highly encourage you to go check out his channel. Now, after the STB hearings, a ruling came out requiring the railroads to self-report their own data regarding train movements and employment figures. Before any of that, however, we had the Association of American Railroads covering for the railroads, saying that none of these reported statistics would help the congestion. And you know what? Let's go ahead and talk about the Association of American Railroads for a second. Not only have they been lobbying on behalf of the railroads for years, they have also been pushing for one-man crews and have been hard in the fight against reciprocal switching. Earlier this year, the STB actually did have another hearing on reciprocal switching. The board sees reciprocal switching as a way to make the railroads a lot more competitive with each other and in effect, help to drive down the prices. However, in light of all this, we actually did end up seeing various statistics and figures from the railroads. Now, I looked at these various figures and you can actually see a lot of these reportings on the Surface Transportation Board's website. You look under filings and then you look under docket number EP7701. And in there, you will see all sorts of self-reported data by the railroads. So I found statistics such as on-time performance, trains holding for crews, trains being canceled, trains being held for power, as well as the number of trains that each railroad had started per week. It was hard to figure out a big picture of how our national rail network is doing, so I wanted to play around with these statistics and figure out one central statistic to see about the general efficiency of these networks. So first, I looked at the unplanned recrues per week happening on these railroads. Unplanned recrues occur when an initial crew is not able to make their assignment or when a crew already on a train runs out their hours of service and has to be replaced. Now, it is true that the railroads differ in terms of how many long routes do these railroads run, how many short routes do these railroads run, how many trains do they run on these said routes. So I do encourage you to take a grain of salt. Again, these are just rudimentary statistics that I am taking on. Also do understand that these railroads have self-reported this information. I went through the charts and added up how many trains of each type get started each week by each railroad. And that is how I came up with the central figure of how many trains does each railroad start per week. And from that, I got a general percentage of for any given train started on that particular railroad, how likely is it to have to have an unplanned recrew? You can see railroads such as CSX having very few relative unplanned recrews, mainly because they run a lot of local trains. And then with a whopping 60% chance that the train would have to have an unplanned recrew, BNSF. It's a startling statement on just how bad the congestion has been and how bad the congestion still is. Also, speaking of BNSF, they've been in the middle of some damage control. Here is BNSF executive and man just only now realizing that he has done a bad job and is about to get fired, Matt Garland. Hello. I want to take just a few minutes to outline a few changes we plan to make to hi -Viz based on your input and ideas. But first, I want to just say thanks. I know we've had a tough start to the year, and I know we're all feeling that. We all have a lot on our minds, and I appreciate all that you're working through, and so do our customers. So again, thank you. So let's talk about hi -Viz. As you know, we introduced hi -Viz in February to not only improve crew availability and to help us remain competitive, but also give our train crews more visibility to manage their time off. hi -Viz is certainly a change from the past, and we appreciate those who've adapted to the new system. We're also grateful for the constructive feedback shared over the last three months. I love how he looks absolutely terrified in front of the camera. Um, you know, 
I don't know exactly why that would be the case. Um, maybe there was something, you know, behind the camera. You never know. First, we're going to eliminate the conjunction penalty for layoffs prior to vacation and or PLDs. This means that after June 1st, if you lay off the day before a scheduled PLD, for example, you won't be subject to the two or three point conjunction penalty. Second, thanks to your suggestions, we're going to add several new ways to earn back points. Here's the short of it. We'll award seven points to each of our top performers each month. Our top performers will be defined by the top 10% of hours worked compared to their peers at a board or station level. Additionally, we'll award one point to those who are available to work in the 24-hour period before and the 24-hour period after a scheduled week of vacation. We'll also award one point to those who have a start on a high-impact day. Finally, those who have a start between the times of 1,200 hours on Friday and 1,200 hours on Sunday will also earn one bonus point. BNSF finds itself in a similar situation to many other railroads. They are in damage control. They are only now seeing that the railroads have been consistently ranked as the absolute worst places to work, and they are now scrambling to fill their classrooms with trainees. However, with talks of a recession on the horizon, it's entirely possible that these classrooms will be full, but then managers will have to go into these classrooms and tell the trainees that they do not have a job waiting for them. And that brings us to our current situation. The rails are still jammed up. Trains are still being delayed. We have talks of a recession because the Fed is tightening up. And things are just overall, they're not improving. They are slowly but surely getting worse. On the labor front, the unions were absolutely prepared to strike. They had been released from national mediation. They were filling out ballots to strike. They were coming out overwhelmingly approving of the strike. However, President Biden has approved an emergency board to figure out the issue. With inflation getting worse and worse, partly because of the railroads, and jobs remaining unfilled, this is just going to make things even worse for the American economy and the American consumer. And in the midst of all this, the rate at which the railroad workers are simply walking off the job and resigning, that rate is only increasing. So, with all that being said, what are some potential solutions? I'll say one thing, um, the railroads have been complaining about the price of diesel fuel. We actually already solved the issue here is the Milwaukee Road with that issue solved. Here is the Black Mesa and Lake Powell Railroad in Arizona solving that issue. And here are our friends to the north and BC Rail solving that issue. Remember those billions of dollars that the railroads have been carrying out in stock buybacks? Yeah, they could have actually been put to use electrifying our main lines. But of course they didn't because the railroad executives just want to get rich. Another thing that the railroad workers have been calling for for years repealing the Railway Labor Act. It may also be worthwhile to look back at the Staggers Act of 1980 and see, hey, wait a second, maybe we as a country made the wrong decision in all of that. Back in 1980, it is true the railroads were suffering and we had the option of deregulation or nationalization. We can look to Europe and see that many of the nationalized railroads over there are running incredibly efficiently. They have almost entirely electric locomotives. And contrary to popular belief, their freight network is actually incredibly efficient. They run shorter trains, but they run many of them. And in effect, they are a lot safer. At the end of the day, when you look at the railroads and you see what is happening, a group of individuals at the very top getting rich while everybody at the bottom is suffering and the entire American economy is suffering, and the American consumers are suffering, there is one word to describe that thing. It is looting. It is white collar looting. The railroads are simply far, far too important to be left to the ruins of Wall Street. I will say, however, that everyone indeed watching this, you are not powerless in these matters. You can write to your state and federal legislators and ask them to do a number of things. Number one, mandate by law that there be at least two people in the cab. A number of states have already passed minimum crew legislation and it is paramount that we see this legislation passed at a national level. Number two, ask for the repeal of the Railway Labor Act. 
We have already seen railroad strikes work in other countries and railroad strikes would absolutely work in bringing these railroads to the table to figure out a deal that actually works for our rail crews. And then number three, talk about nationalization of the railroads. We have already seen the benefits of nationalized rail networks in other countries and it would certainly be interesting to see if that could help our situation. I know President Biden has described himself as the most pro-union president in history. It is time for him to put his money where his mouth is. He needs to do it on behalf of the rail workers that have been suffering for years. So I encourage everyone, write to your representatives, write to the president. Just as an example, California's two senators are aware of the issue and wrote their own letter discussing the issues faced by California's agriculture because of the railroads. But above all else, read and listen to the stories that our rail workers have been sharing. And that just about wraps things up. I understand that this video has been incredibly lengthy, but I want to thank you all for watching. Throughout America's history, the rail workers have built the nation that we all know and love, and it is finally time that we understand and forcefully respond to their ongoing anguish.